you all for coming and joining us and in having a really very important conversation with an amazing guest we have. So before we start, I want to introduce myself. I'm Suman Roy. I'm the executive director for Meal Exchange. And uh, our topic today is food insecurity on post-secondary campus. And before we start, we're going to do some land acknowledgement. Uh, the land we are standing on today is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Vendor peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Metis peoples. I also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Williams Treaty signed with the multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. We are mindful of broken covenants, and we strive to make things right with the land and with each other. We are all treaty people. Many of us have come here as settlers, immigrants, newcomers in this generation or generations past. I would like to also acknowledge those of us who came here forcibly, particularly as a result of the transatlantic slave trade. Therefore, I honor and pay tribute to the ancestors of African origin and descent. Without much delay, I'm going to introduce our guest today. I'm really excited to have uh, Julie Debrusen, um, a member of parliament here with us today. Julie has been an elected member of parliament for Toronto Danforth since 2015 and is committed to building up federal support for a strong, safe and sustainable city. She has worked with the community on strengthening gun control, taking action on fight, uh, taking action to fight climate change, building affordable housing, and supports for the arts. Alongside this, Julie found the Liberal Food Caucus and helped develop Canada's first national food policy, has worked alongside the arts and creative industries as the chair of the Canadian Heritage Co Committee, and presently serves as Parliament Secretary to the Minister of, of Canadian Heritage. Julie, welcome to this conversation. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Uh-oh, okay. you muted that, yourself. Yeah, I was muted. <laughs> <laughs> the, the love of Zoom, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so without further ado, I would, before I jump into, and Julie, what we did was when we sent out the invite to the students, we received a lot of questions from the students that we can do. Uh, I'm, I'm going to ask you some questions from the students, but before that, I want to give you a few minutes to uh, anything that you want to talk about or address. Mm -hmm. Well, Take it no, away. I, I think, uh, and we'll probably get more into this as we have this conversation more like on, on food issues specifically, you know, what started getting me more involved in food issues was, it, it sounds like a funny thing, but it was something from one of my daughter's um, birthday parties. They had a thing where um, people could make a donation. Some of it goes to a gift, and then some of it would go to an organization, and she had chosen Second Harvest. And so I started getting emails from Second Harvest, and I learned from them that they had downtown businesses where uh, people from the business would get together over the lunch hour and pick up food from local restaurants that was too small to stop a truck for to pick it up, but, but that was still going to be potentially food waste that was good, and they would pick it up and then they would deliver it to, to different charities. Um, and, and so I started doing, I, I reached out to them and I said, hey, how about just people who live in a community near a lot of restaurants? I live near the Danforth. And, and so I started the first community-based one where we would go and pick up food. Um, and then I started working with local farmers, markets, and some of our local food banks, and a lot of different issues about it. It really kind of highlighted the part about food and how it ties into income security as well, that it isn't just strictly a food issue when we're talking about it. It also has implications on the environment and how we grow our food, um, how we deal with food waste. A lot of really important issues that tie together, and, and I think it's a really interesting prism through which to consider all the other issues because it's such a fundamental it's such a fundamental for everyone uh, that w it's something that we all share we need healthy food to be able to thrive 
So I, I, conversations like this are important, and, and I think a really great way to push on some really important anti-poverty issues as well. Such a great start, Julie. Thank you. So one of the questions, which is kind of really close to my heart, um, uh, in 1976, Canada signed on to the right to food in the International Covenant on uh, Economic and Social and Cultural Rights, which states that food is a fundamental human right and that all people in Canada should have physical and economical access to food at all times. Unfortunately, the right to food is not currently being upheld. We knew uh, we know that many people in Canada go hungry and disproportionately post-secondary students. Mm -hmm. Prior to pandemic, nearly 40% of post-secondary students faced, faced food insecurity. A couple of campus surveys indicate that this problem has likely been exaggerated during this pandemic. How can the federal government act to upheld the right to food for students? Um, there there are some different parts, and I know that we, we've talked and worked in the past on, on one issue, which is younger students, not, not post-secondary students, but on, on school food programs, which when I started, the biggest challenge was the fact that from a federal government side, the answer is always, oh, you know, uh, secondary schools, primary schools aren't, aren't federal jurisdiction. And, and that was the first, the biggest hurdle, which is why it was really exciting in 2019 to finally have as part of the food policy a recognition that a school food program would be important. So I'll say, you know, when we're talking about students, when we're talking at the younger space for students, I think school food programs do play a large role. I've just started calling them student nutrition programs so that uh, we avoid that jurisdictional debate. But I think that that's that's a really important piece. As far as for when it comes to students, post-secondary students, uh, this goes to how can we provide bigger and greater supports for post-secondary students. Uh, and over and over again, I, I think that, th that it's an area which has more of a gap. I'd say you know, some good pieces have been increases to the Canada student grants, and that in the, in the budget that was just released, um, it will go up to um, a maximum of 6,000 now. So that's an improvement. Most of the, the stuff when I see it dealing with post-secondary students and supporting post-secondary students comes through the period right after they've completed their studies. Like that's been a lot of where the focus has been. So you know, on waiving interest after, after graduation for a period of time or for creating a threshold. Like the, in, now the threshold for starting to make repayments on Canada student loans will be once a student is earning $40,000 uh, a year, so they won't have to be making payments until they reach that threshold. That's after graduation, but it's something at least that, that kind of fits into it. Um, I think we may end up talking about it a little bit more, but I think another piece that ties into this is, is basic income. Yes, I'm so glad to hear this. Uh, as I know that you strongly believe that food security is not always a food issue, but a lot more. So I'm really happy to hear this uh, come from you, Julie. That's amazing. Uh, the next question I have is, we know that you were involved in the earlier conversations around the development of Canada's first national food policy, and would love to hear a little bit more about that experience. And if that policy takes into consideration the major issues of post-secondary student food insecurity. And I'd say it's, it's, it's broader. So it was pretty exciting to see that come together because that's one of those pieces where I got to see it from its beginning. You know, some things you, you kind of jump in midway, midstream, but this was completely a new thing to have a national food policy. And it started with um, consultations. I, this is one of those points where I get to highlight for people the importance of actually participating in those consultations. The food policy consultations, at least at the time, so say a couple years ago, was the most responded to consultation for online responses. Like people really jumped into it, which was exciting. Now, I can't say that it, it may have been eclipsed since then, but at the time, people were really... I, you know, there was a response that I was hearing from department and like, just, wow, lots of people are really, really engaged on this issue. Um, so what are the main components for the food policy um, going out of it? I mentioned that the, the school food programs, 
Another part is, is food waste. Again, not really the issue we're dealing with. And I'm always struggling, by the way, when we talk about food waste, and I, I say it with the best of intentions that I started with Second Harvest, but this challenge of food waste not being the response to the anti-poverty piece, <laughs> you know, like, yes, we need to not waste food, but that is not how to, 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 to break the cycle. And the fact that food banks do amazing things, and I've seen them do amazing things, but that's not the permanent solution either. So that's that's the challenge that you face and, and the struggle. But food, anyway, getting rid of food waste and that climate change piece is one big part of it. Um, and then the other parts turned on access to healthy food. Uh, one of the interesting pieces of that debate when I was at the different consultations was for a while people were calling it affordable food and, and there was a real debate about affordable food, making it more affordable, or is it more the focus on making it um, healthy food and increasing access. Uh, it seemed to be a big flashpoint in the, in the debates. Anyway, so, so access to healthy food. As far as for students specifically, uh, there isn't really a population group that I see as much as a specific population group uh, that's focused on in the food policy, except for perhaps if I would pick out one group, indigenous food sovereignty is a piece, um, is a, you know, but, but otherwise I think it's seen as, as kind of a population-wide approach. Uh, so less that I could point to as specific stu student parts, except for what I was kind of talking to you about, you know, student supports. That's awesome. Uh, are, there, are there other policy initiatives you think could happen on a federal level to better address student food insecurity and what does the Liberal Party think should be done to ensure every student in Canada has access to good, healthy food? Hmm. And keep in mind, the student, it's talking about post-secondary primarily. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I appreciate it. I mentioned the school food programs just because I think that there's a bit of a continuum in how we're seeing food and how we're seeing the importance of food. And, and frankly, even just making that leap into saying that the federal government recognizes a national school food improvement, uh, school food programs important, to my mind, shows um, the jump in recognizing that if you're going to be able to do well in school, if you're going to be able to be healthy and to succeed, you, you need access to healthy food. So to me, it, that's, it's the opening um, into that conversation. And I say that there's still a lot of work to happen for, for the younger students as well. We're, we're not there. Um, from from my perspective, and speaking just you know on on my perspective of it, I think the the interesting conversation is really going to be happening around um, basic income and about some of those pieces more than anything else. Uh, and there will be a private members bill that's going to be coming up for a vote to talk about framework for for a basic income. That's going to be um, an interesting piece if we can get that uh, to to succeed just on how do you properly framework it. And there are, uh, I was talking to you earlier, there's a very active conversation about what, what does it look like. In, in um, British Columbia, the, the provincial government there commissioned a study on, on basic income and whether they should consider rolling one out. Uh, the, the, the task force that they put together came back with a no to the full, to the full um, coverage of a basic income but suggested that instead we work on, on targeting, and this is for the province of BC, by the way, so I'm, that's not a federal report, but, but they, they were focused on uh, at first starting with uh, youth coming out of care and, and focusing on people with disabilities. Uh, one part that I'll, I'll point out is the throne speech um, in 2020 actually did refer to, like it did suggest that we were going to be working on creating a basic income for people with disabilities federally, building on a similar system to what we have with a guaranteed income supplement for seniors. So we have strands already developing on basic income. We you know with the Canada Child Benefit, with a guaranteed income supplement, we've, ca we've covered kind of the seniors and the youngest kids. And I, I think that now we have to look at how do we make sure we create a, a, a better safety net across the board. Certainly. Um, 
So among post-secondary students, our data shows that BIPOC and LGBTQ plus students and students with children disappropriately experience food insecurity. Can you elaborate on if and how the federal government's plan and the national food policy take into account equity when addressing food security, food insecurity and healthy eating? And I am really ultimately, so there were two groups. Let me deal with the people with children first because any other one, it, it, like it's, they're kind of separate uh, in my mind as to how we do it. And I think as far as people with children, the Canada Child Benefit really is a big, a big piece of that puzzle, uh, just because it creates a guaranteed income for 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 children, for and it's larger for children under the age of six, but but it goes up uh, throughout their lives. So that's that's one part that can be a really important support when we're looking at how do we help you know how do we help with food insecurity and specifically the issues of systemic racism. Um, which is, I'm guessing, what really when, when we're talking about Black, Indigenous, people of color, um, and food insecurity, it's really about how do we how do we eradicate uh, systemic racism, and and on that front, that's a much uh, a larger picture than just food, but everything that we take as steps forward on that help on the food piece as well. So, um, I think data is one of the most important starting points to even know are, is the work happening, you know, what is the actual impact of the work? And, and there is actually a fair bit that's been put into getting better data and for Statistics Canada to get better data. Uh, but then the next step is, is how do we um, eradicate systemic racism across the board, say in employment and pieces. Um, just interesting thing, by the way, if I can do a little plug, I, I actually have um, sponsored a petition from people in my community to um, deal with uh, anti-black racism in the construction industry. So um, it's available on e-petitions, and they're 50, they're only 50 signatures away from being able to, to get the, to the 500 to get a response from government. So that's my little plug <laughs> for, for that petition. Um, Interestingly, the budget, uh, the, the funding that just came for transit in the United, um, I don't know why I said that, for Ontario, the, the transit funding actually includes um, that the contractors who are hired have to have anti-racism training and that community benefits have to be a part of those contracts. So again, employment opportunities. The budget that just came out just, I'm giving you pieces because they're all threads, right? Like there are m multiple threads and, it, and, and it, each one isn't the whole answer. Um, but one part that I thought was really um, interesting for creating better options in the trades um, is that uh, the budget included that for if, um, uh, if an employer was going to hire for an apprenticeship for a red seal trade, um, someone who is black, or, or a woman or an indigenous person, people in underrepresented groups within construction or within those trades, uh, they actually get double the financial support for that apprenticeship. So they're just creating more opportunities in that way. But let me bring you to the food thing specifically because you had asked me about food and then we're here talking about food. I, I think the Can Canadian Food Policy Advisory Council is one of the most important pieces that came through as a food policy because that's the ongoing engine to keep looking at it and doing their work. And some of the work that they're, they've taken on as their priorities is specifically, like when I look at their things, they have um, strong indigenous food systems, inclusive economic growth, um, you know, they have um, helped Canadian communities access healthy food and support food security in northern and indigenous communities. So part of the work that they have on as their their tasks that they're working on are also trying to specifically deal with those types of issues. That's amazing. Students, I'm sure we can easily get 50 signatures and push that through today. Come on, get on there and get the signature in. I think that's really valuable. So Julian, this is something that uh, I always think about. Uh, over the last year and 14 months, 15 months through the pandemic, we have seen how uh, Prime Minister Trudeau and overall the federal government 
has talked a lot about food insecurity and uh, really recognizing something that some of us knew for years and years about how food is food security is a big challenge in this country and put a lot of resources towards it in the last little while. But in a lot of cases, the students feel that the post-secondary students, that band of population has been left out from a lot of these conversations. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? And do you agree with the statement? I agree that we, I think that when we're looking at different, you know, age groups and sectors and reasons, I, it is, it's just as I mentioned, a lot of the programs that, that even focus on post-secondary students focus on the immediately after, like the creating job opportunities after, you know, creating the summer jobs programs, um, all of those pieces that kind of try and create employment opportunities, a lot of the focus that I see for post-secondary students goes to that. Uh, I mentioned there's an increase to the Canada um, student grants, so that's one piece. But as an age group specifically, like if we were looking at it as an age group, I, I don't know of as many programs that specifically um, target them by age group. Now, I'll also say I don't know other than children and seniors any other groups that are specifically focused on by age group. So, um, so you know, that's, that's one thing I will point out. But there's, there's a real live issue about how do we, how do we support post-secondary students, post-secondary education? How do, it, it's part of an accessibility to post-secondary education, and that's really working with our provinces and territories as well, right? Because there's an interplay there uh, it's not all federal, but there, there's definitely something because just going even back to the earlier part of our conversation, we want to make sure that there is equitable access to post-secondary education. And if, you know, once it becomes inaffordable, that's a real challenge uh, on the workforce side, on the other side that I was talking about, and on increasing opportunities, and, and again, that goes to how do we deal with systemic racism. So it, it's, there's, the issues tie in very closely. Absolutely. Absolutely. Do we, and this is a question for me, can we ever dream of having a Minister of Food Security someday? <laughs> Just a personal question. <laughs> well, I'd say let's start with the fact that we have an advisory council, a food advisory council, which is a great thing. Um, but, but you raise the point, uh, you know, food is a tricky issue of who does it sit with. Like, does it sit with child and, you know, child and families and, and, you know, development? Does it sit with health? Does it sit with agriculture? Um, does it sit with uh, oceans and fisheries? You know, there, there are many different places that, that can touch on food. I, I would say environment and climate change too, quite frankly, right? So they all, they're, they're, the, the problem sometimes is how do you get a whole of government approach? I'm hoping that's what the advisory council can help do um, is, is to break through and, and kind of poke those holes to say, this isn't just this ministry, it's actually across a few different ones. That's my hope. Uh, we are running out of time, but I've got one last question that I'm going to ask you. Mm -hmm. Do you have any words of advice for students in our network who are keen to create change? And how can students have a say in federal policy and actions, particularly around addressing food insecurity? Um, yeah, I always like to really um, kick this piece in because I think one of the most important parts for everyone is is to, to find those ways to be strong advocates. Uh, there are a few ways. I mentioned, for example, I mentioned that e-petition. And you can go, there's a website called Our Commons. You can see, if you go to the Our Commons website, it's just ourcommons.ca, uh, you, can, you can actually go and see what all the current e-petitions are. What's great about the e-petitions on the parliamentary site is that unlike the ones that you will see from you know, the emails that you might get circulated for other ones. Those collect signatures, but they don't automatically go to Parliament. If you go to the federal e-petitions and you create one of those, if you get 500 signatures, the government must provide you with a response. 
So the difference is, you know, I, I'm not dissuading people from signing any petitions, but the other petitions don't actually filter to requiring a government response. So a really, really easy one in, in the first place is um, consider starting an e-petition. And, and I don't know, different MPs have different uh, policies about it. My own policy is that for people who live in my community, um, I'll sponsor petitions. I don't necessarily have to agree with them. In fact, sometimes I might not, uh, as long as they're not hateful. So, and, and I think that a lot of, I think a lot of members of parliament take similar approaches. Um, the other part, though, is write letters to, to your members of parliament. People think, oh, what's the point? That doesn't have a great value. It does. It really, really does. And I always mentioned this early on in some of the conversations we had even early on. I get very few letters about food. I'm interested in food as an issue myself, but I get very, very few letters uh, from people writing about it as an issue. So um, do write to your MPs. Uh, it's a way to just get onto the radar that that's an issue to be looking at. Um, you know, ask for a meeting if you're working on it. If this is an issue that you're you're actually doing research and working on, and you want to make sure that your MP is aware of the issues, you arrange for a meeting with your MP. Um, and that's my last thing. And I know I see you. You're like, okay, we're running out of time. I'll be really quick. But um, a lot of people will write a letter just to the minister or just to the prime minister. And, and that's good. Like, absolutely write to the minister and prime minister as well. But copy your local member of parliament because they're your voice. Like, they're your voice. And, and, it, it, and I think that that often gets overlooked as, as an important way to, to get your message out. So, yeah, those are my, my big headline tips anyway. That is certainly great advice. And really, I, I absolutely echo what uh, Julie said. Please get involved because we know that this demographic is one of the leading vote banks in Canada in the next few elections, mm -hmm. much more than the boom, baby boomer generation. So mm -hmm. this is your time to get your voices heard because everybody is listening and hearing. So. To all the students who are listening to this, please get involved. And, and if you. I can just jump in on that, it's yeah. a between elections issue. Like elections are important, but by then the platform's already there to some extent. It, it's and, and what what the the importance of reaching out between elections can't be underestimated. That's really where you know you get the more the most time and the most ability in there. So yes, get out, vote, all of that. Not you know that is really important uh, and but don't don't leave politics a second after the election has happened there's a lot of the I, I'm, I'm almost a vegan but I'll call it sausage making all the same vegan sausage making <laughs> happens between the elections so that's that's really when you can get a lot of that work done that's amazing advice thanks a lot Julie Julie thank you for coming and chatting with us we really appreciated all your insight and your advice and your experience uh, and for the students watching, we have our next Food and Politics at the end of the month with Senator Ratna Omidwar, where we're going to talk a little more about uh, the immigration side of uh, students. So please follow Meal Exchange on social media to see the date and the time, and please register. Join us. Julie, thank you very much once again. It was fantastic. Thank you. It was really great to see you again. Thank you. Take have a good care. day. You too. Bye-bye.